Good afternoon, all. It's a huge pleasure to see uh, you all in this uh, Odiani YouTube channel, watching one more of our uh, videos uh, at the topic of people of Gestalt in Odi. Today we have a uh, privilege to have uh, Tony Fraser with us, talking about uh, how he practices Gestalt in uh, Odi work. Tony, welcome, and Angelica, hi to you too. Hello, both. Hello, everyone. It is a real pleasure to have you uh, in this uh, set of videos that we're doing with Angelica together. And I'm gonna start slowly introducing you for those of uh, the audience who are not maybe familiar with your work. And as I do so, please feel free to interrupt me if I say something that's not correct or is not the best description of your work and what you have been doing and still doing uh, in your career path. So to, as I said, today we have Tony Fraser. You have held senior management positions in large corporations in human resources, strategic planning and business development. You use this experience to establish and successfully lead your own organization consulting business. And over that period, you led many large-scale organization and leadership development projects in, in the private, the public, and nonprofit uh, sectors. Alongside this uh, career path, you have continuing coaching practice, and you also now lead the Gestalt in Audi programs at Maven and in the London Gestalt Center. Uh, you're also having quite a lot of uh, um, important positions that you hold, and now you hold the following positions, Chair at the Maven Limited, an OD Consultancy, Non-Executive Director at the Academy of Executive Coaching, Non-Executive Director at the British Gestalt Journal, and Non-Executive uh, non Director at Phoenix Therapy Center in Brighton. This is related to your professional career path. Maybe you would like to add something? Or I can continue with the personal bits so that people can get to know you better. There's pl plenty there, yes. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Thank you. And on a personal note, uh, you're married and you live in Brighton. And from what you have shared with us, you enjoy time with your grown-up daughters and grandchildren, as well as outdoor activities, including cycling, motorcycling, offshore sailing, and growing vegetables on your allotment. That's mm -hmm. plenty. And I think that Angelica can relate on the last bit of, of uh, what you have shared as an information and what she does in her free time. <laughs> I'm just back from my allotment, Angelica. <laughs> I left it a few days ago, um, coming back to it. But yeah. we should definitely uh, exchange on that uh, next time we see each other, either virtually or, um, yeah. or in person. To do that. On that note, welcome again, Tony, and I think that we can start uh, bombarding you with questions and uh, reflecting on your work. And I guess the first question would be, uh, you have been in the Gestalt waters for quite a long time, and something that we can see from what I have shared with our audience. Uh, what drove you to Gestalt in the first place? And more closely, what drove you to create a Gestalt in organizational development program at Maven as such? What's the story behind it? So, so um, the story goes back something a bit more than 40 years, so a long time. So, so I, I started, my first job was actually at uh, Ford Motor Company in mass production and doing labor relations work. And, you know, I quickly learned that uh, relationships in, in organizations and the way in which people behave towards each other um, can often be very sort of rigid and stuck and uh, um, counterproductive. Uh, I dealt a lot with conflicts and strikes and things like that. Um, and I, I had a second job in the oil industry um, in, in a similar role. Um, and then I went to a place called Roffey Park, which is a, um, a management center in, in the UK. Um, and at the time there were couple of guys there who were just developing their understanding of humanistic psychology. So this was in the mid 1970s. And uh, I attended a couple of programs there. And amongst the methodologies or the approaches they used was Gestalt. And I was absolutely, I was excited about it because it, it seemed to me to deal with uh, the realities of human experience and not to overlay some um, kind of uh, s structure on it, but to deal with exp one's experience. And because of that, 
uh, it enables people to understand what it is that they're doing that drives their behavior and experiments and, and their experience. Um, so it was Adam Jukes, uh, um, who was a very interesting character um, and, and is still around, um, who took me to um, a Gestalt training event um, run by a chap called Isha Bloomberg, uh, who himself had trained with, uh, with Fritz Perls. And, and that led to me signing up for a three-year training in, in psychotherapy, uh, which I did in, in the UK and um, in a lovely place in the Chianti Hills that, uh, that Isha bought and, and then used as a training center. Um, and, I, you know, I had a really interesting time sort of discovering what, where awareness takes you and using that directly with all kinds of managers from big British uh, companies that sent their people to Roffey Park, which had a, a very good reputation. Uh, and we used to run this program called Interpersonal Relationships in Organizations. And the basis of it was we would sit there and say, what do you want? in a very sort of gestalt way. And of course, these were you know, normal managers who found that threatening and confusing. And we gradually created a safe space for them to explore who they were, how they constructed their relationships, how they got stuck, and how they, they ended up sometimes in unproductive patterns, and how other people related to them. And I used gestalt in you know, that, that's how I learned to apply Gestalt in a, if you like, in an organization context. But after about uh, five years at Roffey, I, I left and joined a, a big corporation and then um, another one. And, and I ended up at a um, big financial services company um, as head of development, training and development and, and OD. And I used Gestalt, but never talked about it. <laughs> never used the labels, never used the language. Um, but very much used the, the understanding and the insight about, um, I think particularly issues about contact and issues about unfinished business and, and how to raise awareness in the field, you know, to create a recognition amongst my colleagues of what it was that was really going on. So um, I think, you know, the question, how did they get into it? It was through Rafi. And uh, what happened was uh, it informed everything I did from then on, really. It's a beautiful story and certainly something we, I haven't heard from this side of the Gestalt, uh, another side which I come from. And could you tell us about uh, something more about the, the program you created uh, at Maven on Gestalt in organizations? Sure. Um, I think actually, if I, if I may, uh, the, the, so I ran a, cons I'm going to slightly change the question because okay. the, first, the first programs were at the Gestalt Center in London and I've been mm -hmm. running programs, Gestalt, you know, D programs there for mm, 10 years or more, 12 years. The Maven program is really only the last two years. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd been running um, my consultancy business um, going all over the world, dealing with, you know, teams and uh, organizations, culture change, you know, other kinds of change. Um, and I, I was ready to retire, but not, you know, entirely. And after I'd stopped, so I left my consultancy, I handed it over to my business partner. We had an amicable separation. Um, and, I, kind of, I thought, well, now I'm retired, what do I want to do? And I thought of um, developing a series of programs about how to use Gestalt in OD because I didn't come across many people who knew anything about Gestalt. Um, and this is about yeah, 10, 12 years ago. So I talked to the Gestalt Center where I had a good relationship with the, the people who were there anyway from my history, as it were, you know, longstanding relationship. And they agreed to, as it were, host a series of programs. And we started running them um, about 10 years ago. And there are, there are three programs there, um, a kind of core concepts, which is um, a two-day introduction 
to uh, Gestalt and its application in organization work. Mm -hmm. um, and then a six-day program, two times three days, um, which is called uh, In Practice. So this is a skill development. So the first one is about the ideas and the conceptual understanding. And the second one is the practice. And then the third one, um, which is a one-year program, a day a month, which is basically a supervision program for people who are in OD practice and want a, want a like-minded group or want a group of people that they can kind of work with Gestalt um, mm. on organization issues. Um, so I think it was just, I've always felt that Gestalt is like a hidden gem. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very powerful set of, well, a way of being really. It's not just a set of tools, but it, it has a way of practice. Uh, and um, my sense was that, that there would be, there is some real benefit in people understanding it because it, it, uh, it has the capacity to unlock the stucknesses and distances get created in organizations. And, and so I, you know, really I thought I'd just like to share it. I, I had no interest, you know, I wasn't trying to make my living or a career or anything like that, but just, you know, I, I'd used it and had, I think there aren't many people who sit in that space where you have a ther an understanding of therapy and the fine detail of human experience. And you have an understanding of the hurly-burly and driven practicalities of big corporate organizations. And I think I, I acquire, you know, I, I, can, I could sit in that space and so um, provide, and actually, when we had both therapists who wanted to understand how to work in organizations and OD people, and sometimes very senior and experienced OD people, um, who wanted to find out what Gestalt could add to their repertoire, or how, how that could change them. And the pro that's what the programs do. They, they um, I think they, and, and that brings a lovely mixture together, of course, when you have therapists and people who work in, you know, in the relational world together with the corporate people mm. who are driven by um, results, if you like, mm. outcomes. Mm, be beautiful and I'm really really interested if we look at all the videos uh, the, there is a recurring phrase a hidden gem mm. uh, about Gestalt and a, a way of being it's really interesting mm. uh, thank you for that background it's uh, really helpful to see uh, different uh, different entry points in the Gestalt approach right. and, and the maybe just to, to add mm -hmm. so the Maven program um, rather combines a number of these things. So we, the Maven program is over eight months. It, it starts with a two-day introduction to Gestalt. It's for experienced practitioners, OD practitioners, but normally they have had no experience of Gestalt. Mm. Um, and then um, there's a series of one-day um, workshops, but also um, home groups. So uh, if you like, uh, development support groups or practice groups where people get together to exchange experiences about the application of Gestalt. And, and we do one-to-one -one work as well. So we offer a one-to-one -one support uh, for individuals as they, um, as they apply and, and discover. So sometimes, you know, the, when, you, when you work with Gestalt, not everything's comfortable. Some, there, there are occasionally uh, disturbances in the system and, and it's, it's helpful that I think, you know, we can act as a container to create that safe space for people to Experiment. make sense mm. of, what, of their experience and what's going on. And, and I'll just give you one example. I had a one-to-one a, a -one recently, um, somebody who, who's, um, what she's discovered is that um, by raising awareness, well, I, I have these three big sort of, I talk about raising awareness, making meaning, and supporting contact, that these are three important things. And, and she, this, this very experienced practitioner has sort of got hold of that 
when, and, but she came back to me and said, look, I've, I've been doing this raising awareness. And all sorts of things are coming out. You know, people start talking to me about sexual assaults or abuse as a child or, you know, uh, first of all, is it legitimate for me to, um, how can you say, evoke those kinds of experiences for people to talk to me about that? And secondly, what the hell do I do when they do that? You know, how do I hold the space for them? And, you know, what is my ethical and responsible position? These are really, you know, they're important questions. And, and you do, you know, you, you touch over that boundary when you look, when you work with Gestalt, mm. the whole person comes. Mm. And, and, you know, that's partly it's powerful, but it's not always comfortable. It's, it's, it's a real dance uh, of the practitioner. And you, you started uh, talking about how you use the theory. Um, I'll, ask, I'll go on on the second question. The, the Gestalt uh, cycle of experience is used differently uh, by different practitioners. Could you tell us uh, something more on how you use it in your work in organizations? Or if you use it at all? Yes, I, 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 I would say I, I do um, very much. For, for, I think the, the main... I use it as a sort of reference point to try and understand um, how, how the system is stuck, if you say, or the person is stuck. Uh, so you get a, um, an insight from, from using the cycle. So is there, a, um, is there a desensitization in the system? So that the, the culture of the organization is to suppress all kind of physical or emotional experience. So what, we, we don't talk about those things. Or it, is, is it um, that there are sensations and particularly emotional experiences, but um, that the figures are not allowed to form, they're, they're too threatening or too, too difficult? Um, and, uh, and, and so on, and, you know, the, and how organizations often short circuit. So they will go, lots of organizations go through a kind of awareness, mobilization, action process. But no, so as long as they're doing something, they feel safe, they feel okay. Mm -hmm. But the idea of contact, that there is actually some exchange, that they, this goes on, something happens out in the world that's they're just in a sense very busy talking to themselves and and the the cycle gets short circuited and they go back to awareness and and so the process of it it feels like a very busy organization but the world doesn't experience the the point of contact and uh, the organization sort of stays stuck in a uh, an unproductive pattern mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the, the kind of very conventional thing is uh, listening to your customers. And, and you know, that, that's what contact is. When, when I worked as, as head of o, OD and development at this financial institution, I used to go and um, spend a week every year on the counter, you know, in the, uh, on the front line, meeting the customers. I was the only senior manager that ever did that. Mm. And, you know, because I, I believed that contact, you know, that, that process of direct exchange is critical to making sense of and, and making change. Mm. So I, I would say um, I use it as a sort of diagnostic tool. Um, but the other, the other thing, um, the other way in which I, is, is particularly in fostering contact. So... You know, the experience of bringing people together or using, um, you know, often teams will, ask, you know, spend, want to spend time on an away day or a, a workshop. They go away for two or three days. The, you know, the overt purpose is we need to plan, we need to get our act together, those kinds of things. Um, so one, one of my favorite interventions um, and, and we'll talk, I'll maybe talk about unfinished business a bit more um, 
But I, I ask people um, if there are aspects of their relationships that are getting in the way of their being able to perform. And is there, you know, is there something going on here that's not spoken about uh, and not dealt with, but it's making your life harder and you can't, you find it difficult to get your job done because of that. And I say, I'm not going to ask you what it is and I'm not going to ask you to deal with it. I just want to know, is there something? And just put up your hand, you know, if the, it's, it's an amazing uh, process because almost every time, like at least half, two thirds of the people in the room will say, yes. there's stuff going on, we don't talk about it. Yeah. And, you know, that, that intervention in a sense comes from the understanding of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and it's interesting how uh, what you describe that you do with uh, different teams and groups is actually working on the team dynamics and how teams sometimes sit on an elephant in the room which is not being spoken about or not being communicated. And I do agree that raising awareness and staying in contact with some, sometimes with something which seems, which seems unpleasant is important so that the process can get unstuck and the cycle can be finished. And um, I'm going to just connect on, on what you were talking now, because related with the uh, cycle of experience, um, we, in Gestalt we do talk about moderation of contact or inter uh, interruptions of contact, which are basically described as uncompleted contact cycle that you just described when the cycle gets interrupted and falls back on the beginning. And I'm just curious, do you use these uh, interruptions on moderations depending from how we need them as a diagnostic tool in the organization? And if yes, how do they use them and uh, what's the value of it? Yeah, um, you know, there's lots of ways in, in which uh, I, I use the interruptions. And um, maybe I can... Uh, I'll, I'll start with a story um, of... of um, and I was uh, uh, coaching um, a head of finance for, I think it was uh, um, Europe and Africa. So, you know, quite a senior guy. Um, and uh, I'd been coaching him for about six months. And he said to me, um, would, you, uh, would you like to come and sit with me and my team when we meet and um, see, you know, make some observations about my leadership. So I absolutely fine. So I, I attended one of their meetings and the meeting was a planning meeting for the, the next executive committee. For, so this was all of the, the senior man, leaders for the whole of uh, Europe and Africa. And um, what I noticed was, and, and this, it was confluence. So the issue was they were, um, all working pretty hard to avoid any discomfort. In So they had a sense of loyalty to and, and, and respect for the executive committee and a little fear of the executive committee. So what they did was they, they moved numbers around so that the difficult conversations did not have to happen. So there was nothing uncomfortable that was going to be said. Um, and uh, so at the... Towards the end of this um, meeting, the, 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 the vice president of finance said, uh, so Tony, what are your observations? And I think he was expecting me to say something about him and his leadership, and, but I didn't. I said, this is what I noticed. I noticed uh, you guys have put an awful lot of energy into um, making the numbers look okay and feel okay so that there's no disturbance and nobody has to, and what you're not doing is telling the story that the numbers tell. You're camouflaging it. And yeah, so raising awareness of the confluence that was going on. And of course I got a, a <laughs> very aggressive reaction back. They were, they were not happy to have me say that. So um, I, I said, I mean, I did a little more awareness raising. Well, you, d you don't like me saying this then. And um, I mean, cut a long story short, it doesn't always work, you know, <laughs> Gestalt yeah. in the sense of I'm, I probably could have done it more elegantly and gracefully made the 
um, maybe done it in private with uh, with the CEO. But it's an example of um, where you know there was clear a clear process of confluence going on. Um, same thing, you know. There there are, there are other stories, but um, yeah, maybe that's a, a nice example of of in the. I do call them interruptions, by the way, because I I do think. I think it may be to do with my training, but um, the way I think about the interruptions is that they are a barrier to the process of the compl completing the Gestalt cycle and, and the process of contact. Hmm. It's, it's, it's always uh, interesting to, to, to hear stories of... Uh, real life stories of how they're used. And that's the, the idea behind this video. So um, thank you for this um, story of how you use the, the interruption of contact uh, in your work. And um, to continue on that note of theory, uh, could you tell us something more about the concept of unfinished business? And um, how do they, does un unfinished business affect uh, groups or lar larger systems? Well, uh, yes, I, I think um, it's another sort of, um, it is actually an expression that I use um, on, 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 on team workshops. Um, so, um, or, or in, you know, in other interventions, because it is, it's pretty much, you know, used in common language now, the idea of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the classic um, what do you call it, indicator of unfinished business is um, a corporate standoff, you know, where you ha you, usually it, it, can, it can start with um, just two individuals who, where, you know, there's a dispute over, maybe you know the budget that somebody gains something somebody loses something or some recognition where um somebody takes advantage and and claims recognition when it, it should have been a shared um you know some something that was shared so they they take individual credit for something um and that leads to this sort of um standoff and and uh, um it can actually permeate through you know, so whole functions are sort of, I would say, at, at best, um, don't cooperate fully, and at worst, actively uh, work to undermine or to um, denigrate another function, you know, and, and, and you get dozens, if sometimes even hundreds of people, you know, who, who just get immersed in that sort of system. And it, it's it's embedded in, in you know, past events, in past experiences, in lack of trust. Um, and, you know, the remedy is, is contact. So uh, one of the things that I do on, on – and, and I've done this a lot in, in many different settings um, – is I, I provide um, – I, I talk about unfinished business, and again, you know – who's got unfinished business in this group with someone else that, uh, that's making a difference, that's getting in the way. Um, and I don't know, three quarters of people generally on average, somewhere between half and everyone yeah. acknowledges that they've got something that's unfinished and, and about which, and very occasionally it's something positive, you know, some appreciation or recognition or, uh, sense of that that they've never acknowledged um but more often it's it's some resentment or hurt or um frustration that they have that that now is that baggage that gets between them so that whenever they meet there's a sort of frostiness or difficulty or distance contact is not that they're not open with each other and they're not open with each other about the fact you know not only is there unfinished business, but they, they don't talk about the unfinished business and they don't talk about the fact that they don't talk about it. You know, this, mm. but everybody knows, you know, the whole system. So, um, one, once you get people to acknowledge that there is unfinished business, 
And that's a huge first step and that it's making a difference. It's getting in the way. The next step is to create a structure, um, a procedure for unpacking that unfinished business. And I set out a series of um, very clear steps um, in which the individual, an individual approaches another individual and um, first just asks the question or, or makes the statement, I have some unfinished business with you. Are you willing to talk to me about it? Um, and if the answer to that question is yes, they go the next step, which is to say, it's about this. And, and they say what the, un, what the roots of what the unfinished business, um, where it stems from. Are you still willing to talk to me about it? And then they, the next step is to say, this was my experience. Um, so when, you know, this is what happened and this was my experience of it. Mm. And the next step is to have the other person say what their experience was. And the last step, and this is the critical one, this is the, you know, it's the best bit of gestalt. What do I want or need from you now in order to let this go? Mm. And that's, I, I always say that this, is, this could be the start of, you know, an extended negotiation. You know, that it's not because they may want something from you as well as you wanting something from them. And, and you have to be open to that. And I have one group or one organization, quite a, a global bank, um, they, they adopted this as a core part of their kind of organization methodology. They, they called it uh, pathological collaboration. It was, it was part of that pro program. Um, and, but it came, it came to be known as a walk in the garden. So uh, that was the euphemism that they used to describe this pro procedure. Mm -hmm. And so that you'd just go up to somebody and say, uh, you and I need a walk in the garden. And they would, uh, I mean, their head office was actually in central London and in central Singapore and in you know, other places in New York, but it was the words that they used. And what it was, was a, a series of steps that made it safe to engage in that delicate process of untying, untangling the unfinished business. Mm. It's interesting how you brought this. Um, you somehow led me to reflect on how this can be actually applicable also for uh, conflict management and conflict resolution and how it can actually be used from different companies and different teams when it comes to creating a safe, a safe space for things to be resolved as they emerge rather than be piling up and being uh, placed under the carpet. Um, so it's an interesting that, way of... Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, that is unfinished. You know, the, the stuff under the carpet is the unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, th I think it, it's like grit in the cogs. You know, it just stops things moving. Everything gets stuck. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, th I think I, I look at organization work a great deal in unsticking. Um, and in a way, it's counterproductive, uh, counterintuitive rather, not counterproductive, counterintuitive. Organizations are always so much about getting from one place to the next. You know, they're moving forward, always trying to get towards something. And the magic of Gestalt is about stay, staying where you are and understanding it better. Mm. And I think that's a... Uh, it's one of the most powerful things that you do with Gestalt is, is not to buy into how do we get there, mm. but take a real interest in, oh, look, look where we are here. Look how this works. And, and let's see how, we, let's see how we, get here. we got here. And let's see particularly how we stay here. Mm -hmm. How are we stuck? How do we stay stuck? And there is another thing that now you're somehow, as you're talking, I'm reflecting on a lot of things and I'm just reflecting on how this might sometimes be a challenge for companies which are on a high pace and which are really goal oriented. So going back on what's hidden and going back on what's unfinished can be quite a tricky bit to have their buy-in so they can start working. 
And I guess on that note, uh, what do you think is the key to address unfinished business in organization uh, context? Um, what's your experience and what your approach would be? Um, it, it's, Great. The best leaders are congenitally dissatisfied. They always want something better and they're very critical. If they feel safe, they'll also be self-critical. They're not just critical of others. So if you create the safe space in which they can look at what, what's going wrong and how they are stuck, um, in a way, you, you don't need to do much more. It's, it's just the acknowledging. They will acknowledge. They will tell you what they want to change. You don't need to tell them why they need to change. So in a way, the fast pace and the, the drivenness is a fuel for that. You know, so you want to get here. You're not getting there or it's not working as well as you'd like. What's that about? How, what's stopping you? And they will tell you, and and you know they're they're very often very insightful. What stops them looking is often the anxiety and the stress that that somehow they will be held, they will be blamed, or they will be held to account, or they will be punished. And you t if you take that away, and it's just isn't this interesting? And that was one of Ed Nevis's big things. Isn't this interesting? Isn't that interesting? If, if you can get them into that mode, and I think that is the key, to be interested in how they are where they are, then um, you simply by helping them to, I think Malcolm would say, um, populate the field, you know, to, to see all that is going on around them. Yeah. And you don't need to tell them what to do because they're great problem solvers, they're intelligent people but helping them to feel safe enough to recognize what's going on is all, all you need to do to make that, to make those breakthroughs really. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes a bit of support and sometimes um, to deflect them away from bad habits. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, uh, very senior people particularly uh, want to control everything or, want to give instruction uh, and and that can be often can be counterproductive and and you know the using the energy of the people around them is mm -hmm. is a much more helpful thing to do but in a way they need the confidence to feel you know again they need to feel safe enough to do that mm. thanks you've uh, tackled a very important aspect uh, I, I see in uh, English talk is creating the safe place to explore and to experiment um, for senior people, but all, also for teams. Um, and we, 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 we've, you've been really generous with stories and um, I'll push it a bit further if, if you can be even more generous to tell you a, a last story with the story of your work as a consultant um, and use, it, use of the Gestalt approach. So um, another, a, a UK financial, I, I call it a financial institution. I'd been working with the board for about two years. And the board had got, kind of got its act together. But um, in the process, in a way, they become, they, they got close to each the, each other inside the board, but it had opened up a, a gap between them and the second tier, both in the kind of way they thought and, and addressed problems um, and, and something about expectations too. So uh, the CEO um, asked me if I could help with the um, creating a better relationship between the executive board and, and the second tier the second level in the organization. Um, so what I did, um, which I thought was, and, and, and it was sort of directly using Gestalt, was to, um, I got 
groups of eight people from the second tier together um, and got them to um, make a drawing of that showed the relationship between uh, themselves and, uh, and the board. And I, so I put them in pairs, gave them some pens, and, in, and I said, 15 minutes, go away, make a drawing, come back. And, um, it, you know, it's one of the lo lovely things about using like, something like that is that you, you get under the thinking radar. People in their creativity express so much more about their experience and their feelings and so on. So they came back with these fabulous drawings. And then I had them tell the other six. So there were, in, in each group, there were eight. So two, each two came back with a drawing and then told the other six what their drawing was about. And I um, made notes and asked their permission. And so I put all the drawings in a report and all their kind of narrative in a report and, uh, and presented the report to the board, um, who were completely shocked. You know, it was a, a real kind of revelation uh, mm -hmm. to, to them. Um, so I knew that, you, you know, now, so this was the awareness raising and, and, and some meaning making, because there were very clear figures depicted in these drawings. One, one drawing was of an octopus inside a box with the tentacles hanging down and manipulating the rest of the organization. So, you know, the head of the octopus wow. was inside an impenetrable box. A lovely image. Powerful uh, images. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they got straight through, you know, everybody kind of got it. And the board, you know, to their credit, then agreed to a two-day event where um, the, the feedback was translated into wants. So what did the board want from the second tier? And what did the second tier want from the board? And that there was really courageous uh, contactful exchange. So that, that was the sort of, um, there was a bit of setting up and then that exchange, that was the first day. And then the second day was effectively just problem solving. How do we create the world that we now know we each want with, with goodwill? You know, there was, there was enough goodwill and common purpose. So, um, you know, in my, uh, so, you know, we were awareness raising, we were figure forming, uh, and then generating contact. But I, I, it may be perhaps that's where the roots of this idea of raising awareness, making meaning, encouraging and supporting contact. So that's the, the sequence of events that is, you know, I, I think that's what Gestalt is about. And in, in OD particularly, that's what, what stands out for me. And, and it works. You know, it, it was transformational. This, they, they became, you know, a kind of uh, much more, you know, one director resigned because she couldn't, couldn't stand the feedback, couldn't stand what was expected of her. But actually, the board and, and the second tier got together and it worked. You know, it was transformational. That's one of my best pieces of work. And I, I could, funny, I haven't mentioned all the failures. <laughs> well, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece of work and uh, you've made me think of, of all the times. Um, something so transformational happens and how satisfying it is to see people more alive. Absolutely, mm. yes. I, I, one of my kind of core philosophies is and, uh, organizations have this um, battle between collective you know, control to, to control and channel energy and activity, but they also have to generate energy in order for that activity to happen. And uh, most organizations, because of kind of a sense of stress and anxiety, overdo the control and underdo the energy raising. And what Gestalt does is it, in, it enables, it frees up some of the energy and creativity. It allows that energy to, 
to move around in the organization and for people to be able to tolerate a little bit of the uncertainty and the riskiness involved in contact. Mm. That's a beautiful description. Thank you, Tony. It, uh, it was a real pleasure um, talking to you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your sharings.